Okay, so I've got a little bit of a hobby where I like photography. And very early on, I got interested in East European cameras, mainly because they were cheap, but they were also very good. And I bought one, I used it for many years, and then, you know, bought another one, and then bought another one, and then bought another one. And over a lifetime, you tend to collect them, and then one day you realise that you've actually collected perhaps more than you originally anticipated. Um, so these are the cameras uh, that I have which are Eastern European. Uh, there's Zenits in here, Practicas, um, uh, Lupertel, um, some Lomo Cosmic Symbols and uh, even a Kiev camera um, who one of my subscribers will know all about. Uh, but it all started my interest with this camera here which is the one I got when I was 11 years old and started off my interest in proper photography um, after I originally started with a, a little 126 box camera um, but I'm going to start to go through them in depth but I'm going to start with the simplest camera I've got which is this one over here which is a 1969 Zenit B Okay, so when I say the simplest camera, I mean the simplest single lens reflex camera. So this one dates from 1969 and it's got a screw mount lens on it, as we can see here. Um, it's got a shutter speed selector that allows you to go from a 30th of a second to 500th of a second. Okay. Uh, that's the rewind knob there. You've got film advance, which winds the film on and also cocks the shutter as well. You then press this button here to fire the shutter. Okay, that was on B, so it's gone into. So if we go for 30th of a second, that's it. Now, when you look inside here, you will see that there's a cloth shutter. Uh, there's two of them there's one that opens, and then a second one that closes after the split, after the time delay. And the time delay is quite short, it can only be, you know, normally it's 30th of a second, so it's just going to be a blur but that's how it works so there's two shutters in there one opens one closes and when you cock the shutter they both reset back to the beginning okay um, so very very simple camera there's no features on it as such um, I suppose you could class the self timer as a, as a feature um, although it is completely clockwork um, something that perhaps dates this camera's age is that this here is a flash socket so that when you want to attach a flash gun like that one, see, put on the top so you can illuminate indoors you basically attach the flash gun onto this little bracket up here plug it in there and then when you take the picture the flash gun automatically gets fired however there's two different types of flashes there's electronic flashes which is set using X here, and there's also um, bolt, um, like magnesium flashes, which is why you have an M setting there. Now, why is there a difference? Well, the difference is because the electronic flashes flash instantly. So, therefore, what you let happen is you let the first shutter open all the way, then you fire the flash, and then you close the second shutter. With flash bulbs, which are like magnesium strips, they take a little while to burn and they take a little while to get to the full intensity then they burn out again afterwards and then the brightness lowers. So therefore I need to fire the flash actually before the shutters open. Um, so therefore um, there's, there's a different setting there. So the, the contacts close, the flame starts to burn through the magnesium, the shutter opens, exposes the light, the second shutter closes and then the bulb burns out and goes dark again. Um, so that is the simplest of simple. This then comes on to the camera which I actually owned when I was young. Um, this is the Zenith E and it's exactly the same as the one I've just described except it's got the added feature of a light meter. Now the light meter is actually completely separate um, but it's just like built in if you like. So basically you've got a, a solar panel in here which um, absorbs light, turns it electricity, and it moves a needle which is in there. Um, it's a very delicate needle, 
doesn't really have enough strength to power anything. But what you can then do is you can then you turn this dial here until that little circle there goes um, lines up with the arrow. And then on here, there's like a, a computer, as they used to refer to it, scale, where you can read off different speeds and apertures to get the right exposure. Very, very simple. Um, now the next camera that um, Zenith, or the next camera in the range, if you like, is the EM, which I... Now the next camera in the range is the EM, which I've just realised is not here. So where's my EM? So I do have one more camera than what's here. But this camera is based along the similar sort of principles. This is a much later Zenith 11. Um, so we've still got the, the light meter. We've still got the screw on lenses. But there is an addition. And the addition is quite simple. In that there's a little shoe down here. And just before you take the picture, when you push the shutter down, it moves the little shoe. Now why does it do that? Well it does that because on the lenses, of which this is not one, so I need to find an automatic lens. Two seconds. The automatic lenses have a little have a little button on the back and that shoe pushes the button and causes the lens to automatically step down. Um, now that's that allows you then to look through the viewfinder, have a nice bright image and the, sh the aperture is only closed down at the exact moment that you take the pictures. So, so you literally wind the film on, press the shutter, the aperture closes down, can you see that in the lens? And then you press the, press the shutter and the picture is taken. Okay, so that's that. That's sort of where the Zenith EM was. So, like I say, the um, the the eleven is really a development of the the EM. Now, one of the things that they did do later on is that they simplified the shutter dial. On this one, you can see that the shutter dial clicks between the various different settings, and is quite easy to see. Now, if you compare that with the older type. In order to change the shutter speed on these, you have to lift the dial and turn it like that until it dropped down into the right position. And you'll also notice that it spins around when you wind the film on, and most importantly, it flies back when you take the picture. Um, one of the things I found with these cameras is it's actually possible to have a rogue finger in, in the way, and that actually can slow down the, the resolution the revolution of the wheel and can affect the exposure. So the fact that Zenith or Zenit simplified this was quite a good idea really. So this is really the, the, the pinnacle of the, the old camera design in that it had the light meter and the automatic um, aperture closing. However they did develop it one stage further which is this one, which it still has a light meter, but now the light meter is actually behind the lens, and that's great because it means actually recording the light that's actually hitting the lens, uh, hitting the film, and that might be quite important if you have things like color filters on, or you have a, a zoom lens, that, um, things like that, where you're actually reading the light quite a distance from where you actually are. Um, so instead of having the, the, the dial on the top in the computer, there's just a very, very simple arrow sort of um, thing on the side, which, no, I don't think we can see it through there. Um, but it's quite straightforward. And um, so although, the, um, although it doesn't automatically change the shutter speeds or the apertures or anything like that, you can actually look through the lens, get a reading, and actually... Um, if you, if you like, alter the aperture or alter the shutter speeds 
um, without actually taking your eye off the off the subject, which is quite good. Slight disadvantage is this, this actually does use a battery, um, a battery which is impossible to find anymore. But thankfully, there are alternatives. You can use um, air batteries, and they seem to work quite well. Um, later on, I got into Practica cameras. Uh, this is my Practica. Used it for many years. Um, the big difference, um, well, actually, it's, it's very similar to this um, to, to the TTL. And that this this has through the lens metering uses a very similar needle based system. It has the aperture shut down exactly the same, but it does have one more big advantage, and that is in how it how the shutters actually work, because this camera has metal blade shutters. So you wind it on like that, and then the metal blade shutters operate like that. Um, it's just a just a more precise, reliable design uh, and it also allows the shutter to actually work faster um, allows it to go up to a thousandth of a second instead of uh, the 500 what's also quite cool about these um, practic uh, practicals as well is they actually have quite a lot of they have a bigger range of slower shutter speeds as well so if I set that for 4 which is a quarter of a second you should literally be able to hear the shutter work for a quarter of a second and there you go so that was definitely an advantage. Um, more recently I've been coming across um, these practicas um, with the um, with the bayonet lens fitting. Um, these ones are quite cheap and easy to get your hands on. Uh, these automatic type. Um, and they're actually they're actually quite good. Um, you can bas you basically just point it at the subject. You press fire and it automatically exposes to the correct um, exposure. However, if you feel that the light meter might be getting confused by something, a particular bright patch or a dark shadow in the picture, you can quite easily operate this um, button on over here. Um, although it escapes me exactly how you do that right now. Oh, there we go. Um, you can you can compensate for the exposure using that little dial there. So it is actually much more useful than um, you might uh, otherwise have suspected. However, the film, the camera I've actually got film in at the moment, as we speak, is this one here, which is its bigger brother, um, the BC-1. And the BC-1 has uh, the automatic exposure, but also has manual exposure as well. And this is the one I've actually got film in as we speak. Um, I can't remember how many, I've got 15 exposures in there at the moment. Um, it also has um, an, up, um, an exposure lock facility as well, which is quite useful. So you can have an automatic, you can point at it what you want to expose to, and then lift it up and then take the picture. So that's quite good. So like I say, that's the one that's currently, currently in use. Uh, just for completeness, I've got um, these, these cameras here. This, this takes surprisingly good pictures. Um, it's just a little um, viewfinder camera. Uh, it's 35 millimeter. Very, very simple. Very, very simple lens, but takes much better pictures than you'd expect. Now, oh, this one doesn't have any exposure meters, but it has like an idiot system, if you like. Um, if you can look through here, you see the little window next to the sun is lit up, and then if you go across, you've got like cloudy days or really dark cloudy days or rainy days and it, it sort of a, gives you a guesstimate of what the exposure might be and the same for the focus, the focus rings there and it's actually labelled up in both feet and metres but it also has sort of an idiot guide as well so that's for close-up portraits uh, that's for um, you know full body portraits if you like and that's for distance um, I don't know if there's one for close-up, no there isn't a close-up, the close, closest up is that um, but you know you can you can um, focus using the distance. Yeah, if you go on the bottom, you can see there's the um, shutter speeds. So you can run it manual for shutter speeds if you want, and you can also run it manual for uh, aperture as well, or use an automatic.
So that's quite that's quite cool. And of course, uh, the Kiev, uh, which is a rangefinder camera. Um, it's got a removable lens on this. It's got the two viewfinders because it uses um, a range finding uh, system where the pictures overlap and when they line up, uh, they're in focus. Um, I used this only last year and it produced some really good pictures. Really good pictures. Um, right, so I think I bored you enough. That is an unexpected collection of cameras. Okay, so this is a bit of a, an additional, but this is why 35mm at all, really. Um, it was really a good compromise system and a, and, a, and a very clever system for taking good pictures in most conditions. Um, the first thing to note is that obviously it uses 35mm film, which was originally developed for the cinema. Um, so it was produced in very large quantities, it was relatively cheap. And the formulations it could get could go from relatively inexpensive to to very expensive, uh, high quality, um, and you know it was readily available and quite cheap. So you have a nice size camera, uh, good availability of film, good quality film, uh, and that was one of the main reasons. Now, if you look at the way the, th the single lens reflex cameras like these are designed, they're designed with interchangeable lenses as well. So you could take off this standard lens, or you could put on a telephoto lens or a wide-angle lens. You, like you say, you could even attach a microscope. Um, everything with these cameras is, re is really the lens. If we look at the lens, we'll see that um, not only can it focus, but it's also got a, a means of limiting the light with the aperture, aperture mechanism there. Okay, so the light is coming through the camera, and the film is kept in this dark box at the back but when you actually take the picture like so you just end up with a hole through the camera when the shutter is open there's just a hole, there's nothing actually in the camera that affects the picture the light it shines through the lens straight onto the film which is sat here now I've got a demonstration of this what I've done is I've put a little bit of tape where the where the um, where the film should be and there you can see that the lens is illuminating the film and I should be able to focus that's out of focus there we are, I'm focusing on things um, I can't see terribly well through this camera um, viewfinder but you get the idea that the light is shining through the lens onto the film now in an ideal world what you'd want to be able to do actually is to see what the film is actually being registered, make sure it's in focus, make sure it's framed correctly uh, and then you'd want to take this screen away, put the film in its place, take the picture and then of course you'd want to reset it for taking the next picture. That would be the ideal world and sort of it's how a 35mm lens camera, uh, sing single lens reflex camera works. In that, when you look through here where the lens sits, there's actually a mirror sat in there and it's at 45 degrees. So the light is coming in and it's shining up onto a ground glass screen, which you might be able to see there. Um, that glass screen is exactly the same size as the film and it's exactly the same distance as the film. So in effect, it's seeing exactly the same thing that the film will see when you press the exposure. And the way these things work is they work very, very quickly in that when you take the picture, the lens goes out the way, shutter opens, exposes the film, then the shutter closes, and then the mirror comes back down. It's all very instantaneous. And in actual fact, if I do it at real speed, you can see it really, really does happen quite fast. Um, now, one of the problems with putting the ground glass screen there is that you'd have to look down on the top to look at the view, and look at the ground glass, ground glass screen, and you also have to shield it from light as well. However, all the 35mm cameras have these, um, 35 single, single lens reflex cameras have these strange domes on the top, these weird shapes, uh, and that's because what sets in here is a pentaprism, and the pentaprism allows you to look through the viewfinder 
and it reflects around this pentaprism in such a way that it corrects for a couple of errors. Um, if you'd seen before looking looking at the thing, you'd notice that the picture was upside down and transposed right to left, which, when you're looking through the viewfinder, would be confusing. So this pentaprism that's up here converts the picture to the correct orientation, correct size, and then allows you to view the screen in there. And if we were to demonstrate what you actually can see, I don't know if this is going to work, but we can but try. This is working, but yeah, um, no, it's not working at all, is it? But you get the idea. When you look through the viewfinder, you are seeing, um, you are seeing exactly what's coming through the lens, exactly what's going to be recorded. So that when you press that fire, that press that shutter, you get the picture. So there we go. My collection of Eastern European cameras.